And now we're going to hear from Gennady Baruch Fabyshenko, who is the host and chief organizer of this event and the former chairman of Bnei Elim, a Jewish activist organization. Shalom, everyone. Shalom. <clears throat> you know, after 16 years since the death of Rabbi Binyamin, Zef Kahan, and his wife Talia, I'm still glad to see that there are a significant number of people actually came here to show their moral support and who do remember him. And unfortunately, as time goes on, less and less people remember him. Just this week alone, I attended a Hanukkah party with a lot of young people. And when I wanted to invite them for this event, pretty much anyone, no one knew who he was. They said, who, who, we never heard of such a rabbi. And it's a shameful that this day of age, only a handful of people my age really remembers him. And I'm not even talking about people younger than me. Also, this event was made solely on private money. Some of them were borrowed and have to be repaid. So we gave the glossy cards with all the information on it. If someone of you can donate generously uh, so we can cover the cost of this event and future events also. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Rabbi Binyamin Kahan and his wife Talia were viciously murdered by Arab Muslim terrorists just for being Jewish and living in a Jewish land. Is this the price we Jews have to pay for living in our land? Was a question constantly asked by both Rabbi Binyamin Kahan and his wife and his Father, Rabbi Meir Kahane, may the memory of the saints be immortalized and may God avenge their blood. It's a shameful question, but nevertheless, it is a question. And yet, we Jews get, get killed in our land, and the whole world still condemns us. But no one condemned the other way around when, when they kill us, and yet everyone just wants to condemn Israel. Yet, did we survive 2,000 years of persecution and Holocaust so we can be afraid to walk in our land? Did we want so many wars and gave our best so we could be prisoners in our land? And it's really a shame when I tell my American counterparts that I have to watch my back in Israel. I do not feel secure when I'm in Israel as opposed to other countries. And yes, when I do see a, a group of Arabs in Israel, I have to walk another route because most likely I know they will attack me. Believe me, I'm not being racist. It's a reality. And the, but it doesn't work the other way around. So who is the occupier and who's being occupied? Binyamin and Talia were victims of Islamic terror, something that was actually rare and politically incorrect back then, and unfortunately became a norm in today's civilized world. In this 16 year time span, the Islamic terror only grew from being premature to realizing its full potential. And I remember in the early 2000s, Israel was being criticized for being racist when they were stepping up their security during high holidays now, it is a normal practice in Europe and the civilized world. Whatever they spoke back then, just the Europe is actually hearing it now. I never knew personal Rabbi Binyamin, Rabbi Meir. I only read about them. But what attracted me and gravitated me towards them was their pride in Judaism. Because when we were in school, we only studied about Jews being spat on, thrown on, humiliated. We study about Holocaust, but there's no pride in Holocaust. And they're true people. When you read their books, you really understand what Jewish pride and Jew, real Jewish heroes are. So we don't have to look for foreign ones. I, I, on the other note, um, I personally came to this country in my young age, and usually, and growing up in New York City, and usually a lot of young people, they tend to cling to liberal values. And I do myself share a lot of liberal values. And, the, especially the Democratic Party attracted Jews in general in the past because that party was real home for immigrants. Just you know, people came in, they wanted to realize their American dream, and they needed some moral help, financial help. And when they actually came in, and, they, and eventually when they were able to realize their American dream, they were in turn helping others. But about 20 years ago, well, 30, I would say significantly 20 years ago, the party changed. The party dramatically changed with the large Muslim influx. And in today's circles, in the, especially among the young ones, it's a hotbed for anti-whites and especially anti-Jews. And it's very anti-Semitic. While to, to be anti-Semitic openly, it's still something frowned upon. 
but all this hatred was transferred into anti-Zionist. And, and whatever they want to say about Jews, now they can say about Israel, but really mean one the same. And I remember attending a club in the college, in a democratic club, and I mentioned of Alan Dershowitz, who, by the way, is a stunned Democrat supporter. People were screaming at me, and they said, how can you even mention him? He supports Israel. And so whoever, in their definition, whoever supports Israel is really not one of them. I personally don't really involve into politics. I don't really care so much of politics. Uh, I judge each candidate individually. Um, I, I do know that a lot, both on the Republican side and on the Democratic side, they have flaws. But this year, the elections caught my attention dramatically. When I saw Donald Trump being campaigning, it reminded me of the same time Rabbi America Hanna was campaigning. Now, I'm not comparing the two in any way possible. However, the reaction from the liberal left, from the establishment, was the same. I saw hatred in people's eyes. It's, if you don't go with their idea, they, they could even go on to a physical attack on you. And some people were attacked. I, I saw whatever they were, and I could tell you, if uh, Rabbi America Hanna would want in Israel, we would have the same reaction. And it's interesting, they're the ones who preach democracy, are the ones who are actually calling him not our president. The basic definition of democracy is the majority elects and the rest follows, but not in their way. In their way, it's only their ideas, their candidate, and then everything else is completely rejected out of sight. And, and unfortunately, today, I'm, I'm have to, I, it's not that I left the Democratic Party, I, I'm, I'm not talking about politics, but the party kind of left me, because now they really hate, they have this hate for whites and civilized world in general, and Jews in Israel in particular. And as the day of election was coming closer, and I saw Donald Trump won, my God, was I happy and excited and hyper for a week. Because I know that he's the only, the, among other candidates, and I could tell you I'm, I'm, he might be the only one who can actually move the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, where it should be. I know he has enough guts to say no to a Palestinian terrorist state inside Israel. I know he will not allow more Syrian refugees, the same refugees who were allowed in Europe, and they repay them with terrorist act. I may be wrong about him, time will tell, but I know of all other people, he can make wrong things right. And eventually, Israel will have to make a painful decision whether to be a democratic state or a Jewish state. And I just hope and pray that Israeli leadership are strong enough and they will have a leader, someone who's a charisma like Rabbi Kahana had. And with that, and especially with Donald Trump being a president, oh, forget it, Mashiach will come speedily in our time. And let us all say amen. <laughs>